Number four, Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only four. We only need four more people to sign up for the Patreon for us to hit our next major milestone for $6 a month which is less than a pack of Senkos or a jackhammer chatterbait, all Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Katoctin Rods. They'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community, private members content only, and of course, our monthly giveaways. Again, we are so close to hitting this next major milestone. If you would like more information, check the link in the episode description. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. We are here. It is happy at July 4th. Is this now official summertime? Do we call this the official summertime? It's a weird week if you're in the world of corporate like I am because, you know, they give you, they have to pick between giving you the day of 4th of July off, which is a Thursday, or do we just kick that thing over to uh, to Friday? Which one do you pick, honestly? And corporate was like, let's do Thursday and mess everybody up. And then so some people take off Wednesday through Friday. Some people take off Thursday, Friday. Point is, it's a crazy week. I'm taking off half the week so I can probably go fishing, relax a little bit, spend some time with some family, and taste some smallmouth on the river. We got a great topic. And and, and after I created this call-in show, I really like the format. I like the idea of being able to get people on to talk about different opinions and not just hear my opinions and the comments in the comment section because i feel like a lot of this could be very easily just an echo chamber and that's why though we have the call-in format this is why sports talk radio is such a great format and so here is the phone number i have it down below it is 667-307 eight five eight three give a roll call and we'll get you on the line so we can talk about this topic So what does this all stem from? Well, there was a a smidge of controversy this weekend that opened up this Pandora's box for me, which was Jacob Wheeler cut in front of, allegedly cut in front of another person that was fishing. You know, Jacob Wheeler was fishing allegedly a brush pile, whereas the other individual was just going straight down the bank, just doing his deal. And there was a lot of banter that ended up with this, uh, a lot of conversations that happened around this, especially of what is ethics on the water with this? Do you have 200 feet on either side of you? Are you going to be like Tommy Biffle, where if you see one more person in that creek, you're like, you got to get the hell out of here? Or are you going to be like some of these people that fish the Potomac River that are just, you know, very bitchy? And if they see another boat, they get all huffy and puffy that they're trying to steal my stuff. Do we factor in that there might be 6,000 tournaments going out on a Memorial Day weekend and you shouldn't act like a spoiled brat that it's public water? Or... Is there a code of conduct? Is there a code of conduct that we can all agree on here? And I think it's a fun topic because I would like to know when I'm on the water, do we have a code of conduct that we all play by? I already see that I have one phone number in the queue already. So we're going to get to that caller here in a split second. But again, the the caller number is 667-307-8583. This I'm feeling is going to be a really spicy night. We've got a couple of comments we'll get through here. Uh, Chris Owens, most MVKBA guys have been courteous for the most part i usually try to give 75 to 100 yards now is 100 yards going to be the gold standard for the night i'm going to be interested about this oh man i'm still salty about this topic some random cut me off and burn my spot i caught two fish off of at the res Oof. burned my spot that's fun wording i'm going to talk about that and the last one night before we get to our first caller ethics are being tossed out the window. Tournaments are all take, take, take. Bass used to be about conservation. It seems like it's only about money now. Two parts there. One, I think Bass is 100% to blame here because they are just about the money. I had a post earlier today when two boys came on from Michigan and Ohio talking about a great lake in Ohio that got destroyed by the government up there. Where's our NRA for fishing to help us with our waterways? Where is our people that are going to stand by us and be like, this is wrong? And then another thing is like, where is this psychotic nature of us as anglers that, well, this person's trying to hurt me. He's trying to fish my spot. This is my log that I have owned. They don't understand that this is the only log in the lake and I'm the only one that knows that there's a four pounder under there. I own that. 
And if that guy's coming clo- too close to me, it's because clearly he was up all night maliciously thinking about me and how he can mess up my life for my $20 Thursday night tournament. A lot of interesting stuff here, but I'm going to stop rambling because it's not about me. Let's get him try to pull this first caller on. We've got a uh, 276 number here, and let's get him on the show here. Caller, can you hear me? Yep, I got you. Aha, perfect. Without further ado, sir, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Anytime, man. This was a this is a interesting topic because I feel like we all talk about this at the dock or with our friends, but we never have actually had an open discussion with this with the people. You know, I, for me, there's it's really different lakes. I, you know, okay, so I'm a hundred. I'm I'm a I'm a hundred yards guy. I don't care if you go up in front of me and I'm going down a bank. You get up there to 100 yards, you cut me off. I mean, I ain't going to be happy about it. But, hey, that's fishing. If I knew the good spot was up there, I should have started up there. I I think you've got to be courteous enough to give people their room. I think you've got to be courteous enough to, if a person is on a spot, you know, you at least pull up and ask. You know, on the Tennessee River, when people are on a certain ledge and this time of year, you know, you'll go by and you'll see four, five, six, eight boats on Chick or Gunnersville or someplace like that. And if somebody's already there, just pull up and ask, say, Hey, can I go fish this portion of this? Am I going to be in your way? If you're in a tournament, you know, say, look, I I am in a tournament. I know that, you know, really has no bearing. I get it's public water, but, you know, manners, you know, when I hold a door open for somebody, I, you know, I do expect at least a head nod or a thank you. Mm-hmm. I mean, it does, it is the only thing that separate, separates us from the animals, right? You know? Fair enough. It, it is interesting. Do you think that the ethics are across the board no matter where you're at or do you think it really depends on the body of water are, are, are the same ethics on the tennessee river system the same as lake erie you think or, or does it change i think at least that core I, I think that that should be everywhere you know what i'm saying i mean mm-hmm. pull up and ask if you're 100 yards away or you're on the other side of the point or the other side of the hub you know look i, I can't I can't argue with you if you're over there. Now, if you pull up within a casting distance of me, I've been known to throw a half ounce head at people. So, you know, I mean, I ain't scared. <laughs> we'll play Pirates of the Caribbean. We'll, we'll pull upside each other and see which one king of the mountain. <laughs> mm. But it's just, you know, be respectful. There's nothing, you know, look, man, I've fished enough tournaments where I've seen guys who leave their headlights on in the mornings when they're backing a boat down and blinding everybody else to keep them from backing down and seeing guys pull out and pull up the blows over that. How bad does it get on the Tennessee River system when it comes to just pressure on certain spots? This time of year, especially, you know, one of my more local lakes, which is, you know, uh, Watts Bar and uh, Chig, uh, it, they pile up, man. I mean, you can be you can be pretty close to each other. It gets it gets pretty bad. It's probably it's probably one of the most pressured areas in in the country. I mean, honestly, I can definitely believe that, especially when they get out on those ledges. And that to me is where it is. I feel like the ethics change. I think there was somebody in the comment section that said like seventy five to one hundred yards. I, and I feel like, okay, that's a great rule, but then it is like, what if I, I give you situations like, but you're on the TVA and they're all on ledges. Does that mean you get to fish closer? What if you're in the Potomac river? I know there's about a thousand Potomac river guys listening right now. And I would love one of you to have the courage to call in too and talk about that. Like, what about when you're on a grass bed? I mean, yeah, it's so weird. Like the Jacob Wheeler thing is interesting. Cause if he was specifically just driving to fish a brush pile and leave, he technically wasn't even targeting what he was trying to go after. So was he really cutting him off at all? 
Well, and my also, you know, from a, a tournament aspect, I, I agree with what Brian Latimer said in a video that, that he had put out years ago. You know, first come, first serve, if it's multi-day, right? Uh, but for the most part, I agree. Let's say I'm, I'm fishing a spot that I had not fished for the first day or two. So for me, if I pull up on that spot and, you know, I'm fishing it and here comes Brian Latimer and he's in, you know, 10th and I'm in 30th, you know, pull up, talk to me, tell me you've been there. Communication to me mm-hmm. is key. And, and, and I think with the Chris Aldane thing, that was the deal. Chris Aldane pulled in like an entitled little punk. And then, and, and, and look, yeah, I, I would have been, I would have said the same exact thing to him. It is public water. You're right. But there's still a common courtesy to it. Pull in there. If, if Chris Aldane pulls up and he says, hey, man, I've been fishing this spot. I'm going to fish the armpit of this spot, which he said in his very sorry excuse video, you know, I guarantee you dude don't have a problem. I guarantee you dude don't have a problem. How much entitlement and if he does? He's just an a hole. I mean, come on. I mean, yeah, I agree with that. Like, how much entitlement is there actually in fishing? Because I really feel like listening to people on social media and stuff, it, it seems like there's a um, a healthy amount of it. I think there's a lot of whiny pros. <laughs> I'll I, tell yeah. you that. And that ain't that ain't just coming from me. I'm friends with a bunch of them, and I'm not going to name one of them. But there's a couple that have won AOIs at the highest level. Who have told me things. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that's also a big issue. Is like, what? When does the entitlement kick in? Is it just that everybody at different levels are act like they're entitled, or is it just because it's it's the people that are the at the upper echelons that have this entitlement? Um, oh, this is a great question here from Brandon. Brandon says, "What? Yeah, what?" I think it, there's a. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I no. think. I think a lot of just tournament anglers and, and I'm one, right? But I think there's there's a lot of tournament anglers. You know, I took a couple of my friends out on Cherokee one day. We were pulling up and uh, you know, it, this was April and we're fishing uh you know, we're fishing bluff walls and we're smashing them. A guy sees us, he pulls over and uh you know, he starts coming down and he tries to cut in front of us. Well, I nose my boat in so that he can. And, of course, he begins to tell me, hey, we're fishing a tournament. Uh, you know, uh, I've been fishing bluff ends all day. And I was like, well, you're fishing the wrong spots, man. We probably got, you know, 18 pounds and we're running center of the bluffs, deep water. And, you know, I gave him the tip. Hey, go do it. But this buck wall right here, we done catch them on. So I don't know why you think you need to cut inside of them. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. And it's it, why do you think you need to do that? Or is it, again, is that the issue that we have is we just go back in our brains like, well, it's public water, so we could do whatever we want. And and this kind of ties into something that you just said earlier about the egos and who gets the right away. What if you are, this is Brandon Solis on YouTube. What if you are fishing a local derby, but the Toyotas are fishing as well? I'm assuming Brandon, you fished the Potomac teams or the battle of the border series when they went out, uh, on the Virginia side and the Toyota series (laughs) went out on the other side. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Who takes priority? That's also an issue. If you feel like, well, I don't care. My 12 club tournament is just as important as the Bassmasters. Like, I mean, yeah. But I don't think you that's know, right, if though. If you're on that spot, yeah. If you're on that spot, and and look, and I'm I'm KVD, and he comes wheeling up in there and asks me if I can fish with him. I'm a pro. I should have more than one spot. If that's all I've got, well, that's my fault because I've already been there for a week pre fishing, and you know, however many days it's been that the tournament's been going on. Mm. I mean, sorry, man. And that's if the person wants to say no. You know, for me, I understand they got a lot more on the line than I do. 
And if they're just respectful to me, I will return that. But if you're not respectful, and that's what I'm saying. I mean, it's just manners. And that's, mm-hmm. you, you know, to me, you say, well, it's public order. I can do whatever I want. Well, you know, you can't just do whatever you want. You can't do whatever you want anywhere. And I'd even be one of those guys that'd be willing to argue that enough people don't get punched in the mouth <laughs> because they're keyboard warriors. And that's the problem with society today is people, you know, me growing up, I'm 50. When I stepped out of line, I either gave one or I got one, if you know what I'm saying. And we went on about our business and it was done. Oh my there ain't gosh. enough people that know what it feels to, to get one in today's society. They just ain't. There mm-hmm. ain't enough people that knows what it's like to take a butt whooping. And this is how you get escalation. Oh my God. I mean, that, that is, that, that is a thought. That is a idea we could go down. Um, I do think there's something here. And I know guys, we got the, we got the calling queue really, we got two other calls in here, which is fantastic. I'm going to get to you if you're on hold again, the number is six, six, seven, three, Oh, seven, eight, five, eight, three. I feel like this is definitely going to be a hot topic for everyone. I think there is something where if you see that there's a Toyota series and I, this is going to piss some people off, but, or the Bassmasters or the MLF, why is it the tournament organization's fault for scheduling the same time they come out? Or is it the individual that decides to participate in that tournament? If you have a, a different tournament organization when the Toyotas or the elites or what have you come in, should the impetus be on the angler to say, I'm not going to fish this because it's going to be weird to compete with these guys. Or should I be like, you know what? The tournament's happening. It's not my fault as a tournament director. I'm going to go out there and fish. But, see, here's the thing that, that again, the entitlement and the, not, and the, the low amount of self-aware. We talk about bass fishing tournaments because we live in that world. I read a statistic not too long ago that somewhere between 75 and 85% of People who identify as bass anglers do not own a boat. Mm. Now, on top of that, I have, I don't remember what it was, but how many people that fish, okay, know who Chris Aldean is? And how many boats that we know that are fishing local tournaments are rat? Mm. So, some low profile pro, I mean, honestly, most guys are not going to tell Chris Zaldane from Joe Local, who's got a, you know, Pepsi rap because he's friends with the owner. And so what I'm saying is most guys, even though Chris Zaldane might think, well, I'm Chris Zaldane. Everybody knows me that fishes because I'm a pro. They don't. They don't. Dude, uh, Hank, th- Hank, thank you so much for calling in. I really appreciate it. This is a great call to kind of get us started tonight. I can see <laughs> the uh, the every every word you spoke, there's more people hopping into the queue to, to voice their opinion here. So I, I don't want to keep you too long. Um, you got anything coming up? Man, uh, you know, just dropping videos. We changed the schedule. We're doing uh, five videos a week, three long plays, two shorts. So, by the way, Bass Geek, everybody, yeah, I know. I got some opinions. You don't have to like them. <laughs> this man was born to be a radio host, I swear. Uh, he's got the voice of an angel, and he's got the content to back it up. Uh, B- Bass Geek, everyone, go follow him. We're going to be getting on to the next call here. Thank you so much, boss man. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Pop that. Anytime, brother. You- Thank you. So that was our first call. We got another call lined up. What do you guys think so far? Do you think he was right? Do you think he was on board with everything? Uh, We're going to our next call. 571 is the area number. There's no name. I got to figure that out with the dashboard is how I add the name of a caller or whatever. So I can, I can yell out the name of the caller so they know that they're on. But sir, you are on. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. 
Excuse me. How you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from uh, Manassas, Virginia. I'm a pretty much a strictly Potomac River fisherman. You are definitely the person I want to talk to. I, yeah, I heard you. I heard you mention that earlier that you wanted to get a couple Potomac River guys here. So here I am. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I'd love to get your thoughts on just kind of like the topic, so to speak, that we're we're talking about right now. Yeah, so I mean, as it pertains to, you know, the specific Jacob Wheeler incident, I was actually watching live when that happened. Um, you know, I feel like that's a little bit different than some of the scenarios that arise on the Potomac. I mean, just given the situation that they were in, Matt Becker and Jacob Wheeler, I mean, like, they know the score tracker information, so they kind of know the situations that different guys are in. So obviously in that case, I think when Wheeler had like, what, 100-some pounds and Becker's like fighting for the cut, I mean, that's just ridiculous on Wheeler's part. And I even saw Becker mention like, hey, if this was you, um, you'd be whining about it too. And, you know, knowing – not knowing Wheeler because I don't know him personally, but – just kind of watching him, he 100% would have said something. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we all know that, right? Oh, yeah. Like, 100%. I mean, so obviously that situation is different. Um, and then, you know, the Potomac River, I mean, I fished Lake Anna a little bit, right? And obviously people are going to be a lot, a lot, a lot closer to each other on the Potomac than they are on Lake Anna. You know, some of the things that I would put, like, put myself in on the Potomac, compared to Lake Anna, like there's some things I would do on the Potomac in terms of getting close to people that I would never even think about doing on Lake Anna. Right. Just cause it's like grass fed fishing. And you know, if someone's going up a shoreline on Lake Anna, I'm not going to cut them off from that. You know what I mean? So I think it's just very situational. Um, I, I agree but, with that. It's super yeah, situational. On Potomac, yeah. I mean, yeah. On, on the Potomac, it's just bound to happen. <clears throat> I never open my mouth about it. Um, I don't personally mind fishing in an area with 10 guys on a 250 yard stretch of grass. It just doesn't bother me anymore. I'm so, it's just like, it's just, I, I expect it to happen when I go out. I just do. You know what I mean? I, I agree. And this is something that was very insightful with the, the interview that actually just dropped this morning with, with, with Jarrett and Chase, who grew up in Ohio and Michigan, where one of their biggest lakes is like 4,000 acres and they have 200 boat BFL tournaments and they, right. what, what are you going to do? And and they talked about like the, the assembly line for people flipping pads and they come to the Potomac and they're like, holy shit, there's so much water. But and I feel like it is like, it has to be, the rules have to be so situational when you're on the Potomac versus Kerr or Smith of, and then also it's like, is it Memorial day weekend? Like no shit. Like that's what are you going to do? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. And I think this is where I fall into a trap of, I feel like the rules do ebb and flow depending on the situation you're in. Um, if you got the Toyota series yep. and the Potomac teams or, or any other club going out there, after you drop down in your first spot, at that point, it's just going to be a shit show. Like, it just is. It's not worth fighting about it. It yeah. just is going to be a shit show. I agree. I was out there. Um, what date was the last BSL? Was it like the 20... 20- something of june right 22nd i can't remember off the top of my head but um there was a team's tournament that i was participating in um the same day as the bfl and obviously we deal with that several times a year right toyota's bfl mm -hmm. and um i put my first spot was going to be mad Oldman. so i mean it was a very 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 small um cove sort of stretch of grass right in front of a retaining wall and I mean, we were pulling in there at the same time another guy was coming in. I mean, we were coming right into that little cove at the same time. We both plopped down. We were, I mean, maybe 40 yards away from each other. And we just pulled down and we fished and we were talking to the guy. And I mean, it's just, people know that that's just, it's just how it is. You know what I mean? And it just doesn't bother me personally. I know other guys, you know, obviously I've been yelled at before for encroaching too much and. I've gotten upset with people before, but it's at this point, it's just me personally, I accept what it is and I just fish. And I think the way that the place fishes allows for that. I just think there's so many fish on these stretches of grass where you, sh you just shouldn't let it bother you, you know? 
Yeah, and it, it is interesting when you think of grass versus a dock. If you're fishing, if you're fishing the bank, and beating the bank. I mean, and then guys, Absolutely. again, the call-in number is six six seven three zero seven eight five eight three. You know, if, if I'm going down the bank and I turn a corner and I see somebody else with, with fishing the docks the other way, yeah, at that point, I probably just go up and around and I fish behind them. And it is what it is. Now, if it's yep. grass, yeah, that that does get touchy. But I've caught fish before and had people come in. I, w- I personally think as an athlete, you losing your mindset and stressing out about the variables you can't control, it does not make you fish better. I rarely do I know, and I know the comment section is going to be like about this one time, but you've never beat the shit out of somebody else in their boat and then caught 30 pounds. I don't think that happens much. You usually lose your cool and you spin out. And so why worry about the variables you can't control? Exactly. I I mean, I I completely agree with that. Yeah, if if it's docks, or if it's somebody going up a bank, sucking some way downs, and they're there before me, I'm just going to go find somewhere else to fish, right? Yeah. So I treat these grass beds differently, man. I'll pull in behind them, mm-hmm. and I'll just fish. I mean, them being there doesn't really mess up my mentality, or I don't go, I don't sit there and go, oh, I'm not going to be able to catch them now, because I've learned over the years that on the Potomac, that is just so far from the truth. I mean, you yeah. can pull into somebody, you know, 50 yards, 60, 70 yards behind them on a grass bed while they're fishing one way. And you can start catching them in the same water that they just ran through. You know what I mean? It's just, to me, it's so different. I, so, I just think, you know, so if I, I heard you guys talking about priority. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 no. Keep going. You talk about priority. Go for it. Yeah. I heard you guys talking about priority in terms of like, you know, who, who own, not owns the spot, but quote unquote, who, you know, deserves the area that the, the guys who paid to be in the Toyotas or the guys who paid to be in the BFL. Um, remind me, what's the entry fee to be a boater in a BFL tournament? So BFL is three guys, correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, it's like 350, 250 around there, if I'm not mistaken. McCluskey, SB, I know you're listening. Tell me if I'm wrong. Um, and then Toyota series is a thousand bucks, over a thousand, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, let's just assume it's, 250 to 300 i mean Hmm. that's not that far off from some of these club tournaments right so i mean if you're talking about who's like spending the money to you know own a spot or deserve a spot i'm not giving it to some bfl fishermen just because they're in the bfl you know what i mean i mean we all paid money to be in these tournaments too so that to me the whole priority who deserves the area that stuff is just I, i don't consider that i mean you're I'll give you the same respect as I give a local who's out there with four people on their boat, got their kids. I mean, none of that matters to me. Now that's if the entry fees are the same, correct? If somebody has to pay five grand Um, for a tournament, do they get a little bit more priority? Let's say the Bassmasters were there or MLF or or whoever. Yeah. So I've been out there when the tackle warehouse was going on too. So um, Admittedly, yeah, probably if I saw one of those guys out there, I might have left or not left, but I would have given them more space. And that's probably not a right way to think about it, right? I mean, I shouldn't treat them differently, but admittedly, I probably would. Like if it was, you know, if the Bass Pro Tour was there or if the Tackle Warehouse Series was there, maybe. Um, But that's probably wrong. And I'm probably wrong for that. Why? Why do you think uh, that? Because in the end of the day, they're fishing, like, in my mind, I'm thinking, like, okay, if I'm in the position to win $80,000 in the case of the Tackle Warehouse Series, I think that's what it is, and then 100000 for the Bass Pro, it's like, I don't know, I would be pretty infuriated if some guy just came and kind of got all over me. But, you know, on the other end of my mind, I'm thinking, well, I mean, I'm in a tournament too, right? Yeah. So I, I paid to be in it, regardless of the payouts. Obviously, they're nowhere near the same, but, I, you know, I, it's sort of a personal conflict there with me. So I guess you could say I probably would react to the situation differently, but and, and, I don't know. And I'm you probably brought, wrong. And, no, but you brought up a fantastic thing, and I know guy, there's a ton of more Potomac people that are that are listening in that could comment on this or call in. Uh, again, the number is 667-307-8583. I feel like it's part of it is the tournament directors too. Maybe we could put it there. Cause if, if there was no tournament when the Toyotas go out, do you go out there for fun fishing? 
I, I, I think there's a vast majority that maybe would say no, maybe would say yes to that. But that is interesting where if the Toya, and I, I 100% agree with what you said with the BFLs there. If entry fee is the same as a one-day event, like, come on, it's the same thing. Who cares? It's when you keep crashing yeah. up at the levels. At what point is it morally wrong? Is it the Bassmaster Classic? Is it the Elites? Right. Is it the Opens? Is it the Tap Toyotas? At some point, they're putting out enough money to where it's like, you know what? I could fish, but maybe I shouldn't because it's just a dick move. Like, Yeah. I think yeah. that is interesting, especially on the Potomac where it does when the Toyota series went out there, I think there was like three or four tournaments that went out. I know um, in April you had, oh. oh crap. It was one weekend in April. You guys can help me out, but it was the battle of the border. There was three kayak tournaments going on. There was the uh, Mr. Bass for Pennsylvania and Maryland all the same damn weekend. And that's just, that's insane. And maybe that's not our fault. Maybe that is just tournament organizing overlap. Now, yeah, I was going to ask, when you say put it on the tournament directors, are you talking about them scheduling tournaments knowing that, you know, the BFLs and the Toyotas are all coming? That's what you mean, right? Yeah, and what I would ask them is, like, the BFLs make sense. If the if the elites had an event, do they move? If the toy like, when would they consider to, we should probably move off a date because these are the people that are coming? Yeah, I mean, I hear you there. Um, obviously, you know, there's a prime time in which we all want to fish, right? It's like late March to the end of June. So everybody tries to get, you know, the majority of their tournaments in then. And you got to remember that, you know, Potomac teams like uh, Bob Petty and uh, Ed Dustin, who runs the Battle Series, they're, I think, I'm pretty sure they have to apply to the park and yep. like arrange these dates. So it's not like a given that the park's just going to say, hey, yeah, you can just kind of do whatever you want on any given day. So, you know, it's, I, I can feel for them on that end that it's probably hard for them to kind of avoid it, especially when you got a bunch of different clubs trying to go out. You know, they can't all go out on the same day. I mean, Leeslevania is shut down at noon on a Saturday. They're not letting anybody in the park. So it's obviously like a capacity thing. I mean, so. Well, and that boasts something know, else about I mean, do- Yeah, Leeslevania needs to like expand its infrastructure, something bad with how expensive it is to get into the damn place. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't place too much blame on the t- tournament directors there just because, you know, they're competing for dates as well. I mean, so obviously it sucks. I mean, I hate it that yeah. I have to go fish with all the Toyota guys and PFL guys, but no, no, yeah. I mean, maybe it. blame is a moral question that if the BFLs, I think we, everyone in the chat also agrees with this. Yeah. Who cares about them? It's fine. Compete against them. Toyota. Eh. What about with the elites? Because even like I think with this MLF event, you know, let me let me know in the comment section down below. There were other events there that was being held too. There were, were local derbies, and they were there getting the shit pounded out of them for six, seven days. Like at some point, even just from an ethics of the fishery, like Jesus, that that's a lot in a short period of time. But again, you're right. Yeah. Whenever you get your permit is when you get your permit. Um. Yeah, maybe right. there is no, there is no right decision to be made with this yeah it's tough i mean there's a lot of different moving parts but you know and going back to the original you know question at play i just think the potomac it's just i'm speaking specifically on the potomac it's just something you're gonna have to accept when you're here and i don't think saying anything or opening your mouth while you're out there about a guy, unless it's just something absolutely ridiculous where your line's getting crossed or he's um, going in between you and the bank, unless it's something like that, I just don't think it's worth saying anything about. I think you should just fish. Um, it won't be the first time. It's not gonna, I mean, it won't be the last time it happens. Um, it's, you're just going to get close, especially during spawn time. I mean, I'm sure you've seen it in Belmont Bay. Mm-hmm. You could jump across the boats in there sometimes. I mean, it's it's craziness. So it's just something you got to deal with, and you got to fish through it. You do, and I think the the hardest part is not fishing the Potomac. It's culturally, if you grow up on the Potomac, is when you leave there and you go to the Tennessee, Kentucky, the South, where maybe subconsciously you're you feel comfortable fishing closer to people than they're used to. Um, because I know that's one thing that's right. stressed out a lot of people that aren't from around here. They come here, they feel claustrophobic because it's like there's too many boats around. It's like, guys, this is, this is norm. This is I-95 traffic, baby. This is what you're used to. 
Yeah, that's. I mean, I would be freaking out like if I went down to I don't know any given lake down south, right? And I and I start doing what I do on the Potomac, and then some dude's trying to fight me. I'm like, well, that's all I know is like fishing within <laughs> 50 yards of somebody else. You know what I mean? So it's like I, I almost wouldn't know how to act. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure what goes on in the Potomac is not like considered the norm in most places, right? No, 100. Um, percent I think that's I mean, why Florida guys do so well here. That's probably that's at least one reason. Yeah. I think. Yeah, I mean, it's part of it. It'll really get in your head if you're not used to it. I'm sure. I can't imagine. Sir, thank you so much for calling in. I really appreciate it. Um, again, is there anything shout outs we can give for, for to you or anyone else listening? Um. No. Not really. Shout out to my father for giving me the ability to grow up and learn the Potomac so I don't freak out about people being near me all the time. Yeah, and based on our first caller, watch out because people are packing on the water apparently, so be be careful out there. (laughs) Uh, Oh, yeah, for sure. All right, boss. You have a great evening, and I'll talk to you later. Uh, And then, guys. You as well. I appreciate it. This was fantastic. Two fantastic phone calls. We had one person just dropped. Uh, you can call back in. Uh, you were a 703 number, I believe, that just called in and then was on hold for a while and hung up. So I apologize for that. I'm going to get to some of these comments real quick here. You know, that, that's really interesting there. Like, And it's not to blame the tournament directors. It's not that. It's just, and I get it, You know, being on the board for Maryland where you have to file early for a permit and stuff. But there's got to be a moral thing like... I, it would suck for me if I was a director or a person fishing a tournament if like the elites went to the Potomac River or the James and it's like, oh, we have a big tournament the same weekend. It's like, fuck. I like, you know, do you really want to pull up and fight Jacob Wheeler or Zal Zaldane is a midget? I'd fight him. Never mind. But you kind of get the point there. Like, it's just it's just drama that I wouldn't want to have. We got a lot of great comments though. We got Matthew who says, it seems like there is no enforcement on the water, even for boating laws. Maybe it's just the area I go to. But I remember more presence from coast guards, et cetera, as a kid. I think a hundred percent one issue is the budget that these places have to be able to enforce a lot of the boating laws. Cause you're right. Like I mean, to be fair, when I'm in a kayak, I'll get stopped. When I'm in a John boat, I'll get stopped. When I'm in my Ranger and I go to a lot of boat ramps, they just don't stop you. If you're in a nice bass boat, generically speaking, I know some people will always get stopped, but in general, I just feel like yeah, I don't get looked at enough or there's no one out there really. Well, uh, let's see. We got Jeremy. We got Jeremy with a good comment. Jeremy, you should call in. I haven't talked to you in forever. <laughs> Wheeler was protecting his main spot like anyone would in tournament situations. Same with Jordan Lee on those mats with a frog in practice. You know who yeah, you know who was around the Jews and who is hole poaching. Hole poaching, that is so interesting. What what would hole poaching be? What would area poaching be? If you're on a grass mat, somebody shows up because you're catching them, that's normal. I mean, if you're on the Potomac and you smoke a six-pounder out of the chick or mad a woman, you know people are going to come over. Now, Jordan Lee, there's an interesting argument you can make there because he's leading the tournament that's nationally televised, tons of cameras, so you can incentivize that maybe people are going to go there for other other reasons. If it's the same day of the event and somebody catches one and comes over, I feel like that's different. I don't oof, I don't know. I don't know. Would that be different with that? That's interesting. Now that I'm thinking about that, I'm kind of adjusting my mind about it. Now, the other thing was he said you weren't fishing a frog. I remember that. You were here the other day, but you weren't fishing a frog. That's an interesting comment there that Jordan Lee did make. So what? I see somebody throwing a buzz bait and they start smoking them. Does that mean I'm not allowed to change to a topwater bait? If I visually see a dude catch it on a buzz bait, I need to tell myself I no longer have the right to throw that bait at all? Like, that's bullshit. Like, you're not entitled to be like, if you throw a Zara Spook and I watch you blow up on one, and then you'd be like, oh, you changed to a Zara Spook. Exactly, I would. Because if my co-angler was throwing a Cinco and smoking 35 pounds, I would be a complete idiot not to switch baits if he's kicking my ass in the back of the boat. What's the difference there than if I see you throwing a bait and you're having success? Uh, Tom, we got Tom in the comments section. Oh, let's see. We've got callback number. Oh, he just dropped. Uh, What percentage of anglers actually tournament fish? That is a fantastic uh, question. I think 
only 10% of people actually tournament fish. We got Nick here. Nick, complete BS. Well, Nick, call in. The number is 667-307-8583. Call on in. I'd love to get your opinion on this. Uh, this is definitely a hot topic about the Potomac River and everything. It's like, what is ethics on the water? Anyway, what percentage of anglers actually fish tournaments? I'd say it's very minuscule. I really do think it's like 10, you know, 5 to 10% of the population. But again, tournament anglers probably spend more GDP wise. And that's what you have to understand about the economy, the economy of fishing and everything else like that. In fly fishing, great example. There's not a lot of competition compared to bass fishing. But the GDP is evenly spread around all those fly fishing anglers that keep that afloat. That's why there's, I guess, pound for pound is the wrong wording, but we'll go with that tonight. Pound for pound, all fly anglers spend so much on the tackle that they have. I think, could be completely wrong about this, could be, that bass anglers tournament anglers probably spend a higher percentage of gdp in this this circle than the guy that is like a casual i don't fish tournaments i fish from the bank in general because the guy that is in the top two percent three percent of anglers in the tournament situation if you're a tournament angler you're probably going to buy a boat you're probably going to stay up on the hottest baits got to buy the hottest baits you got to get new fishing like you're spending more money so i think i think the gdp is is not evenly uh distributed uh, let's see. We got, uh, was saying that in regards to the whole, you weren't throwing a frog, but you are now. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Nick. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like that to me is BS. Like, yeah, I don't know. I get if you're on this spot, but if, if we are in a big pocket in Smith mountain Lake and I'm on one side and you're on the other and I'm flipping a jig and I clearly hear that you're throwing a buzz bait, you can hear the noise and he's smoked 20 pounds. And he, and he comes around and is like, oh, I didn't see you throwing a buzz bait. He's like, yeah. And then you were, and I changed because I'm not retarded. Like, I'm sorry. Like, that's just kind of like, I, I don't, I, that's just a, a weird excuse comparatively. Yeah. Don't be on Jordan Lee's spot, but then you're mad that he's now throwing the exact same bait. It's like, ah, oh, well, I don't know. Yes and no. I guess it's the context of the situation too. Uh, oh, let's go with this one here. Again, uh, phone number is 667-307-8583. We will have time for two more callers. I was fishing back-to-back -back tourneys this weekend. I took third and fifth respectively each day. And my buddy and I was fishing next to uh, first both days. Nobody was near us in Woman Saturday, but Sunday when he smoked a big and sure enough, a boat pulled up next to him and started casting at the same pool we were on. Yeah, that's the Potomac, baby. Sadly, for better or worse, that's how this stuff works. Now, did you pull out a gun and shoot him? Because that's where some of our people feel like that's probably what you should do. Uh, happens all the time in the Potomac. So many anglers lack respect. Okay, but this is the thing. is Lack respect or common courtesy to, to do that on the water tournament or not. I That's the issue, Josh, that we're talking about now, is what is courtesy and respect? Is it... If you have four boats in Matterwoman, is that too many boats and then no one else should fish Matterwoman? You know, if you go out on Memorial Day weekend or 4th of July weekend on Lake Anna and there's a shit ton of boat pressure, is it like, listen, there can only be three boats allowed in each creek. And if there are three boats in each creek or kayaks, therefore no one should fish that creek at all, just go home. If it is a Potomac River, and you have the Battle of the Borders, the Potomac teams, three kayak events, and you have Mr. Bass for two different states going out all in the same weekend. Are you shocked and saying, well, this is crazy. The, the river's busy. Like, at what point is it, like, we need to understand. A great thing I heard from a guy that I have on the show is there's a difference between a Saturday and Monday. If I have to share water with somebody on a Saturday, that's on me because I booked a client. If it's a Monday and I have this whole river to myself and I don't see anybody on it. And then somebody drives over and purposely sits down next to me. That's completely different. And I was like, that makes sense, actually. Yeah, like it's just kind of context of the situation. Let's see. Okay. Uh, happens all the time in the Potomac. So many anglers lack respect or common courtesy to do. Did I just read that one again? I did because I'm an idiot. Uh, Matt is, that woman is a, is giant and we were fishing uh, a school that was probably 50 by 50 yards wide. No reason for that. Nice. And then we got Jeremy again. 
Uh, how is that BS? There were two guys on those mats, Jordan and John. Then out of the blue, a guy not making the cut pulls up on the guy winning the tournament. Awesome, dude. Thank you for the context of this situation. That does shed light on what was going on there with them. And, and yeah, that's interesting. Again, this is where I'm thinking we learn this from umpiring uh, when you umpire. It's like you do have some hard and fast rules, but then you have rules that depend on the situation that you're in. I think when it comes to ethics on the water, what we're learning is there's a lot of gray area. There just is. And it's hard to have hard and fast rules because they don't translate necessarily to everywhere that you're actually fishing. Jeremy, obviously fun fishing, it doesn't matter if you copy a bait or not. That was a $100,000 tournament. No, no, but but I guess what I meant by copying a bait is, let's say, Jeremy, you and I are fishing Smith Mountain Lake together at a BFL, and I'm on one pocket, and... I'm on the other side of this creek and you're throwing a buzz bait. And I start out with jig again, we're in two separate boats, but clearly you're throwing a top water and I can hear it or I can look around and see it and you smoke them with it. And I don't, what is the moral issue if I switch baits now in the con that's, the, that's what I was saying. And I was not trying to, and I apologize that this came off wrong. I'm not saying like comparing that to Jordan Lee, it sounds like this guy specifically went over there to try to, hurt him specifically his intent which is something we haven't even brought up yet is just your intent his intent was to specifically to hurt jordan, jordan lee which is completely different my point was if jordan lee was just upset that somebody was copying what he was throwing that to me is where i think there's a little gray area if you've been on the potomac or james if you were throwing a top water and people see you're smoking it and no one else is throwing it why couldn't you cop? Why would that be wrong if you copied what someone else did? Because your co angler, and again, Jeremy, I mean, come call in. We can have this conversation. I think it'd be really, really fun. If your co angler is using a certain bait and they catch him, are you not allowed to use that bait? Just an interesting question. But again, it sounds like the intent of the angler fishing around Jordan Lee was to do Jordan Lee harm. It wasn't just a regular competitor just fishing an area because there's fish. It was because Jordan Lee was fishing for $100,000 and he just wanted to purposely sabotage Jordan Lee. And I think that that's the biggest thing about this is the intent. You know, is somebody getting up on Josh Evans' fish because, you know, F Josh Evans and his, and his friend, I purposely want to do them harm or is it my day sucks. I'm going to make a couple of casts here. I'm going to leave. I think a lot of it has to do with the intent of the angler. I got Chris Owens. Uh, and there's no way to prove that you weren't going to switch baits after you saw the jig wasn't working. Yeah. And, and that to me is just an interesting thing. Cause I've had people argue with that before on the Potomac when I switched around baits and they, people would get upset. And I guess my thought is like, what, if I see you catch fish, and this was like, I had a co-angler at the time that did this, that got mad at me for switching to what he was throwing because he was throwing a stick worm. And it's just an interesting concept in his mind that he, I wasn't allowed to switch to what he did. As soon as he saw, as soon as I saw him have success on that, he feels like I shouldn't have been able to switch. Context where I brought this up. But I've seen other people where I've been fishing an area with a... Um, Crap, prop bait. Sorry, a prop bait. I got it. Prop bait. People change. We're looking for a topwater bait. I didn't feel bad that they switched to it. Like, I just thought in my head, yeah, no shit. If I threw a topwater bait or a whopper plopper and I caught one, people around me are probably going to be switching to a topwater bait. Uh, let's see. We got Chris again. What if a buzz bait was your backup? You were just going not to switch to it because someone else caught them? Yeah, and I think this is the difference between like, and I get 100% I am jaded because i do put out some content and example is sleeters like you know you guys know i've done one or two videos about that place i have caught them pretty well there in the past and i blew the lid off of maybe i wasn't me but i'm the one that put it out there about the swim jig about the specific swim jig that i threw the dyed tips of the tail all that crap and how i fished it in that small lake put it out there i saw people throwing it i didn't get mad about that it is what it is um, we got Josh here. Uh, no, not saying it was F Josh Evans and his friends, more of a respect thing. If I see someone on fish, I'm not going to pull up next to them or within a casting distance and start casting at the same fish. That's complete BS. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's bullshit. I don't 
I do not not think that if somebody shows up and starts casting at you, is it bullshit? Yes. Is there anything you can do about it? No. And I think that's just where my mind is. Like, yeah, I fished the Potomac my whole life. You have too. Is it suck when people do this? Absolutely. Do I try to not worry about it? 100%. Personally, it's how I handle it because that's how emotionally I can stay stable in the day and so I can keep fishing the best of my ability. Uh, how many rods with different baits are on every boat? Michael, a uh, shit ton. Again, that was a, again, I think the frog comment based on what Jeremy just said, which makes really, really good sense. It, it sounds like the context was this guy was specifically trying to do harm to um, Jordan Lee and his ability to win the event. And that was kind of like the issue there. Um, and then exactly, uh, Josh Evans, that's my point there. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like it, it really does. Yes. Do they, are they doing shitty things? Yes. Is there anything you can do about it? No. So why bitch? And then Josh Evans, bent rod pattern folks. Oh no, a hundred percent. A hundred percent bent rod pattern is a thing, but it's also, then I guess that's the moral gray area is if you are fishing a grass patch, you're going to have a lot of boats. That's Florida. That's the Potomac. It's whether people are going to follow the bent rods. And I've made a show about this, following this specifically, where you really can't follow the bent rods because of boat pressure. We had on a biologist for the Texas, Univer Texas University, <laughs> for Texas Park and Rec that actually said scientific data points that boat pressure is actually more effect affects yeah has a greater effect on fish movement and population than the forward facing sonar that episode dropped last week and he said like they don't care whether it's a sea dew a pontoon boat or a bass boat the pressure of a boat will shut down fish far more consistently than forward facing sonar with that said it is funny that the antithesis of people seeing you catch a fish and you moving in it just shuts down the bite in general Generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, if you get 30 people, if I hook a bass in the grass and 30 people come over to me, it does completely kill the bite for everyone. But the difference is, is you got to have the middle fortitude to just stay locked into your spot and not move because those guys will get bored and eventually will leave, you know, and, and that's just, that's just what you got to do about it. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, Jeremy, how has, uh, yeah, Jeremy, I lost my thought. Shit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know what just happened to me. Uh, I just had a stroke. I just pulled a Joe Biden. Uh, how many rods with different baits are there on every boat? It's a absolute shit ton. A crazy, crazy amount. Um, and again, yeah, it sounds like everyone's got a hot and heated opinion about this, which is quite fun. Uh, Nerdy Bassin, he's got a great one here. Nerdy Bassin. Uh, it's like unwritten rules in baseball. You don't bat flip and bloat, gloat. Thomas can speak American. You don't bat flip and gloat when you're up big. Jacob Wheeler was up big and Becker are just trying to make the cut. Not really the time and place for that. Yeah. And that's interesting because how am I going to word this? I'm going to word this like shit. So I might as well say it anyway. Bill Belichick would run up the score. Michael Jordan would run up the score. People that are wired that way are, are a little psychotic. I don't know Jacob Wheeler personally, but I know to become one of the one percenters, you're not well-rounded. You're not a nice human being in general. Nobody that's elite in their field, whether you're a doctor, a soccer player, a bass fisherman, a CEO, you are not in the one percent of your passion if you're not a little broken. And the idea of like letting up on the gas, that's just not in their DNA. Will they also bitch if they were in that situation? 100% because they're whiny hypocrites, but they're really good at what they do. I mean, there is this guy named OJ Simpson that was definitely not a hit with the ladies, but good Lord, did he play good at football. And we give people like that breaks in life because human beings are just a terrible species. We really are. Go buy a dog. We all should. Uh, let's see. B. Callie. B. Callie, I also need to reach out to you, boss. I need to get you on the show. I think you called me the other day or texted me. I need to respond to that. I'm not going to iCast, but um, we'll get that show lined up. Uh, fishing a bank. Fishing a bank moving to the back of the pocket in a tournament and a boat pulls up right in front of us within casting distance. I'm fishing a boat 
tournament. They were in a different uh, tournament. That's absolute BS. This is a fun one to end on tonight. This is a really fun one to actually end on tonight. And I love like the keyboard warriors are out, but who has the guts to actually come on the phone call and let's hear your opinions. But um, we talk about fishing in front of you. What about behind you? If you're going down the bank and you go down the bank of docks and you're going left and I'm hauling my butt up the creek channel, I'm allowed to be where I'm at, and I see you and I really want to fish those road oaks, but I start going the other way. And that person turns around and gets mad at me for fishing behind him. What do you think about that? You're at Lake Anna, fishing docks. Someone's going left, and you're like, I'm going to swing in behind and go the opposite direction of him and fish down the other way. My brain, personally, he fished that dock, it's over. This is not a Bassmaster thing where it's $100,000 and it's a $5,000 entry fee, I'm assuming. Does that mean I can't fish any dock because I assume somebody's going to come back to it? Like, that should be allowed. If somebody leaves or their boat drifts off, I can start getting into the rotation. Um, I've had people that have yelled at me at Lake Anna before because I did that. I went the other way and they're like, well, I'm fishing the, um, fishers of men. Like, what are you doing? Like, again, I think that's interesting there where people say like, well, it's in my rotation and you're out of my rotation. If you're on a grass mat or a grass flat and you're fishing a section and then your boat starts to move away down and I wanted to scoot into where you were fishing and try and lock down, am I in his area because he decided to move his boat? I think that's something that's interesting because I've heard professionals complain about this before, but I think with the with the way there are so many boats out there right now and there's so much pressure on these lakes, you got to have the thought that once you leave a spot, it's no longer yours, that you don't own the spot or the area in general with that. Uh, let's see. Uh, I was casting where they were when they sat down. I kept casting over their lines. That is hardcore, dude. Do not get shot over it. That's not worth it. Um, let's see. Uh, they can fish where I left, but not. They can fish where I left, but not where I'm heading. Fair game. Yeah, I, and I think that's the hardest thing. And that, and that really shows you the importance of your first rotation. Like where you drop down first is super duper important. Um, and you can talk about boat trawl and all that crap. Because at that point, you are fishing behind people. You just are. Uh, let's see. No problem with going behind anybody. And that seems like everyone else. Everyone else here is like perfectly fine with uh, with basically fishing behind people, which is kind of cool. Uh, they can fish where I left, but not where I'm headed. I like that. That's interesting. I really like that line. I'm going to have to use that line in the future there. Uh, again, guys, uh, call in number is 667-307-8583. Uh, we got, let me check the old Instagram. I have not checked Instagram to see what kind of messages we got there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, here we go. Mike Murray fishing. Sure looked like Wheeler was blocking Becker from fishing JW's juice from the previous day to help Avina try to get ahead of Becker. Oh, the plot thickens. That's a good little part. I know Hunter's probably in the chat somewhere. Hunter could talk about that because he was down there watching him all day. Uh, if he was helping Avina, that's interesting because that, that strategy at that point or just being a dick if you're trying to help out one of your friends. Well, technically, it's probably being a dick still. Yeah. If you're trying to help somebody else out in the tournament, because didn't that happen on the Niagara River five years ago, six years ago? Like it was a couple of years ago that they were fishing the Niagara River, and then one of the competitors just stopped fishing to help the other one make the classic. Technically, I guess it's not illegal, but it just looks trashy as shit to do something like that. So uh, that was fun. Um, we got my boy Kurt. Hey, Kurt, congratulations on getting married. I hope you're enjoying your honeymoon period. Congratulations, sir. Uh, Anyway, we got another comment here on Instagram. Uh, how's the fishing on that Potato Mac River? Uh, on the Potomac? Yeah, uh, Potato Mac. Yeah, I know. That's what's funny is I almost read that correctly for the first time, which is kind of shocking for me to read things like that for the first time. We had a, we had two really good call enters. And this is, uh, yeah, and we got another one in here. We got B Cow says, got to love Lake Anna tournaments. Yeah, so the, uh, oh, sorry about that. So, Call in show format. This is what we're going to do. This is going, we're going to do one call in show a month because right now we don't get a lot of phone callers. 
We only get a couple of phone callers each time, so I'm not gonna do this every single week. I'll make it more of a thing. And as we get more phone callers, I'll increase the amount of shows that we do that are calling. Um, but yeah, just talking about this, I thought it was a fun topic just to get everyone's perspective. Like if it's a kayak versus a boat, things like that. Um, and it's also, know your positioning. So example is this, I was fishing, it's big, called Big Slack up where I'm at. It's basically a dammed up portion of the Potomac River. Where we live in Maryland, Western Maryland right now, it's horseshit. One day I'm going to move to like the Culpeper area. So I'm kind of close to Lake Anna and the Potomac so I can fish different bodies of water. But it, it it's a little mud puddle, but it's my mud puddle. I call it home. It's the Ohio River of the, of the wet, of the east, of the east. But I had the boat positioned dead nuts in the channel marker, very narrow. And there was a ton of boats going by. And I did not get mad because I knew where I was setting up, people would have to cut around me. But I had to set up there for my casting angle on a spot. Again, context matters, I think, so much with this stuff. Oh, my goodness. Lieutenant Dan, the one-legged wonder from High Pole God Service. He's in the chat. Uh, what is the difference in etiquette between boats versus kayaks? As a kayak angler, I feel you have to have more tolerance fishing behind or having other guys fish behind you since you don't have the mobility. Also, sometimes I have boats beat me to spots I was heading to long before them. It's a little irritating, but it's just part of... Yeah, so this is how I do it. A kayak and a boat are not the same thing. Period, end of story, and I'm talking about safety. I have a 250 on the back of my boat. You have a Torquedo. I could kill you in an instance if I'm running places. And so what I mean by that is, first off, therefore, I need to treat you differently. You can't handle the same wake. You can't handle the same water, wind, all that stuff. So kayak tournament is going out. If you're a boater, be insanely on the lookout when you're hauling ass in the morning because somebody will probably not have lights on and you could kill someone. Be insanely careful if you think there are kayak events going on, especially on the Potomac River. So number one safety thing, they're not, even though some kayakers want to be treated like boaters, they're not, be respectful of them because even if you set down where you think you would set down for seeing another boat in a spot, you set down too close to them, you could flip them over in the water. And depending on the time of year, it could be a bad situation. So just be very mindful of kayakers that, yeah, whatever you think about them, the safety things got to play first. Try to set down a little bit beforehand to your spot. Understand that they can't move around as much. Even if you have three trolling motors on your kayak, you're just not as mobile as a 250 Mercury or Yamaha. With that said, so they only have so many spots they can hit. If they are in Matterwoman, they're probably stuck in Matterwoman. It is what it is. So you got to understand that and move around. Go to the chick. Go to other places that they're not around. If you're going to be fishing around them, just understand like that's the deal that you're dealing with from the boater side of it. I mean, again, these are just my thoughts and my opinions. Um, on the, if you're a kayak and you're fishing offshore, be careful. You know, understand that there's a lot of knuckleheads out there. And if it's not a bass boat, it's a pontoon boat. It's a jet ski. Like I've seen some crazy things from people fishing ledges on Kentucky Lake with these barges going by. You can do it. I'm not saying you can't just be insanely careful because for every angler that has etiquette, there's going to be one knucklehead that doesn't. Um, I really don't think that answers your question at all, Chris. But um, yeah, but the thing is like bass boaters in general aren't dicks. It would be the jet skiers. It would be the wake boaters. It would be if you fish the Aquaquan Reservoir, it's the goddamn rowers. The the rowers, the wake boaters, the jet skiers, those guys 99% of the time are a bigger threat to your fun day out on the water than a bass guy. Even though we complain about bass boats versus kayaks, I would rather take a guy in a kayak or a bass boat than dealing with anybody in a <laughs> anybody in a rowing boat or a freaking weight boat. It's just absolutely a nightmare. Um, tuned in late, uh, would be curious to hear all the all the guides you talk to and how they manage guiding the, with tournaments on their body of water. It is an interesting balance for sure. I mean, Tyler, you can also call in. This is a call-in show. This is a 667-307-8583. I know you're bored. We've had a couple of great callers on from Tennessee all the way to Northern Virginia calling tonight. Um just talking about this topic about ethics, uh, Chris Owens, the individual middle-aged rowers, dude, I'm telling you, I went a couple of tournaments this, this spring and I had my ranger to be fair. 
And those those freaking rowers, dude, they don't care. It is like a chihuahua on PCP. They will get in your business. They don't give a shit. They don't care if you're the president, you're Mike Iaconelli, if you're just Joe Schmo. They will just, they'll go right through you. It's insane to me. Um, and that's why I'm saying like, I just, in context, I would pick a bass boat guy or a kayak guy to fish around than having a wake boat or a jet ski or somebody else like that. I've been, I've almost killed a jet skier before and I was not, tr- I wasn't trying, I wasn't trying to, but it's just, they were here and all of a sudden they zipped and cut right across me. And I just thought I was going to see Jesus and my girlfriend at the time. Well, my wife girlfriend at the time was in the boat with me and it was just, it was, I just looked at her for a split second. And when I looked back, they went across me, you know, I, it, it can be scary stuff. Nothing better than a jet ski driving around in the grass bed that I'm fishing on the Potomac. Yes. And they wave at you and you're like, are you having a good time? And it's like, no, I'm not really. I'm not right now. Thanks for asking. Um, let's see. We've got another call here. I had a 60 year old man act like he was about to fight me. Chris, that sounds like a story. A 60 year old man on a jet ski who's going to fight you on a grass patch. That is hilarious. Uh, let's see. We've got high pole. Let's see. Uh, okay, I'm calling. Oh wow, we got, we're gonna have we're gonna have Tyler Hypel calling in, and if anyone else wants to call in, uh, we got six six seven three zero seven eight five eight three. I see a five seven one number here, and it, probably it's the one legged captain. I think it's Lieutenant Dan. I think we got Lieutenant Dan calling in there. Uh, caller, you're on the air. <laughs> yep, it's Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> yeah, man, I, I tuned in a little bit late, but I, I was like. I'm I'm really curious to just to even hear your uh, your thoughts on it because you talk to a lot of guides too and how they manage you know tournaments like I know you know Chris he fishes tournaments on Potomac he guides there Billy Cole's on Smith Mountain me on Anna um, but yeah it's just an interesting dynamic to guide on the body of water and also fish tournaments and there is definitely some ethics that goes into that as well. The ethical part of it, and I think. It's interesting that you mentioned that you and Billy Coles have this really good transparent thing where you understand about the branding and guiding and stuff like that and how important it is. I I think what's interesting is when you set, when you set up your guiding and that's been the fun question to talk about, like uh, captain Steve Chaconis, who I mentioned earlier, that's what's interesting is like, if you set up a guide trip on a Monday, you're, and this is what Steve said, which is like, if you set up a guide trip on a Monday, that's way different in how you need to approach that day versus you set up a guide trip on a Saturday. Um, knowing, oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. knowing that like, Oh, if, if I have a grass area to myself on a Monday and somebody drives over, I get he, a little bit more mad about that. But if it's like a Saturday and somebody drives over, it's like, yeah, that's, I, I did that to myself. I shouldn't have had them come out on a Saturday for a guide trip. And, and I think that's a very interesting way to look at it. Yeah, no, I agree with you. So how I run tournaments, especially in the summer, in the spring, um, if I get guide trips on a day where I know there's a big tournament, most of the big tournaments there, I I did fish this year, but there is, it is a completely different way I approach it because I'm trying to respect the fellow tournament anglers just as much as make my clients happy. Um, So yeah, there's a lot that goes into it and you do have to juggle and be a lot more flexible. Um, But yeah, I think... you also on the body of water on you have to be able to sacrifice one or the other and i've definitely sacrificed tournaments more so than i have on the guide i've always made guiding the main focus um because you know there's a balance and it it does and people notice your boat more when you're fishing tournaments when you're out guiding so you definitely do give up spots and all that and it just makes an, an interesting situation you can definitely still be competitive but i do hear you like it is. If you set up a tournament when you know there's a, a, a guide trip, when there's a huge tournament going on, you have to approach it completely differently. You, you do, um, unfortunately. And I think the hard thing is like, I, it depends on the guide, but why would you set up the guide trip during the Toyota series as a random example? Like, like, uh, even if it's yeah. even if you're not going to fish the tournament, just so your client would have fun. It's like, hey, do you really want to come out when there's 600 other boats zipping around us? Um, yeah. yeah, no, I agree with that. Luckily for Anna, like you don't even have to worry about there being a tournament that big, but I like, there's only a handful of tournaments on Anna each year. So that I do kind of get away with, but I hear what you're saying. Yeah, that would be tough, especially on Smith mountain, the Potomac. Like that is a kind of an ethical dilemma there. Me personally, I would never be like, yeah, we're going to go out when there's 200 boat tournaments out there. Cause you know, that's, you're doing them a disservice. And I, I think, 
like just being honest as a guide, that's I think what has gotten me the further and keep kept the business growing is that I'm very honest about that. Like if I tell people, Hey dude, this is going to be a terrible day. Like don't do it. Let's just, you know, reschedule this for something else. Uh, you, you have to be able to that instead of looking at it as, Oh, whatever, you know, we can just chalk it up as a bad day. I don't like doing that. You know, I want to make sure it's the best day possible. And two other points to that. And the first one being about the competitive nature of the individual, it's something where at least, you know, Billy Coles has told me it's like the guide service pays the bills and the tournaments are just for fun because I can, I break even on those because yeah. of the guiding. And, and so I, I think the way he, he put that is like guiding comes first because you're not going to get rich quick off the BFLs or the FTBs. You're just not. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. You're, you're not. Um, that's exactly how I looked at, especially this year too. Last year I was way, more com i would say more competitive as far as the tournaments and i wasn't even i'm way better on the lake now even with just that year but i i don't i look at it as fun uh and, and stuff like you have to when you have a guide a guide business on that lake i don't think that i think last year i'd made the mistake of getting into wanting to you know be crazy good in tournaments and don't get me wrong i'm very consistent on that i'm very consistent but i you have to understand that you have to be able to sacrifice one for the other. And in the case of a guide business, you have to be able to, you know, sacrifice for the, for the business. Now, it seems like you're also conflicted on that, so to speak. And I could be wrong, but if you are, why? Um, I, because I'm competitive, I guess. Fair. I think that's why I'm conflicted on it. Yeah, like, because I'm competitive and I want to do the best I possibly can in a tournament when I go into it. But... You know, that's what, you know, my, my long run goal is definitely, I'm expanding more of where I'm fishing. Like I think last time I talked to you, I, I fished all over the state this year and, and doing that. And that's because I want to get into, you know, bigger tournaments and, and keep progressing that way. And then kind of just have, you know, the business be the business on Anna. And of course I'll still jump into tournaments here and there, but you know, I think you just got to look at it exactly as said Billy does as it's more of just a, an outlet to stay competitive and, you know, and have fun and then, you know, keeping the business as your, you know, the forefront on it. But yeah, and it's tough. I'm sure you've heard this from other guys. It is, it, it's not easy. People think if you guide on a place, you should like win every tournament or so that just, that doesn't happen. It's, it's, it's not possible. Um, you know, you can be very consistent guiding on it, but you can never, you know, it's, it's hard to guide and have, a week full of trips and then fish a tournament on Saturday and think that you're going to have enough time to either find new mm -hmm. fish or, you know, fish for those fish. I'm fishing for scraps a lot when I fish tournaments. Like the things that I'm, the bags that I'm putting together in tournaments, a lot of the time, those have been beat to death by me and my clients. Um, and I have a little bit of time to go find stuff or go do things that are, you know, maybe, maybe just a little more advanced or a little difficult that I can't put, you know, clients that are just want to come out in beginners. Um, so that sort of thing. So it's, it's hard just to cycle through that amount of fish with clients and be ultra competitive on the body of water that you guide on. And I think eventually, I think that mold can be broken. Um, if, if Mick double is listening, Mick chicken, I know you're probably out there listening. Like, I mean that, uh, Mr. McCluskey, he is very, you know, I've always said my, my mentor said this, you know, authenticity is the currency of the future. And, being genuine and with with a mr mccluskey you billy coles people are just like they are very upfront with how it is you will get to a point where you're just good enough that you don't have to have all the super secrets to be competitive you'll just understand a body water on a different level and you'll be able to transcend that and there are anglers out there that like like a billy coles and people like that that can do that they will just learn it so good that eventually it, they can make it work yeah yeah, I agree with that. And that is like, that's one of the things is I am so transparent where that can actually hurt you in, in a sense too competitive. Cause there's things out there that, that yet you learn on a body of water from spending as much time as a guide does that your guy that gets to fish there once a week or, you know, a few times a month just isn't going to figure out. So I agree with that. I can go out onto Anna more than any body of water and just read the day and that day's conditions and know that what I'm going to need to do to make those adjustments, but especially during busy season, 
like it is it's really hard because all those fish are grouped up for the most part and if you are fishing for for solos that's you're more hunting so than you are you know with scope out deep um but yeah no i agree you definitely the curve the adjustment curve speeds up a ton um and being transparent about that all that stuff is helpful and uh yeah you can read the the it, it well but still when it's busy like when you're running you know four to six trips a week and then you're fishing a tournament like you know it it can be tough just to go back because because you have all that knowledge from that week and what you put clients on to get fish and you know where the fish are but they've been beat up and, and you know we run different cycles and different rotations on spots but if you have like late spring summer like during these busy seasons it's hard e- even still where you know all the fish are like the, those fish get smart They're, they get smarter yeah. and smarter every year yeah and it's such an interesting dilemma about how much it, in a world where you have this this conundrum how much information you do you withhold and it really comes down to i think of the individual and you know let us know in the comment section down below what everyone thinks how much information do you withhold versus like how important is the win? You know, something that I've mentioned before on the show is I'm going to save up and get the, the cellular technology to where I can live stream tournaments and I'll do that. And it's been brought up to my fan group. It's like, you are literally going to kill your ability to catch, to win by live streaming the events. But my fact is my constituent base is not a trophy. It's my fans. It's, it's my, it's what I've built. And that's more important yeah. than the trophy you've built up a huge following. Um, the guy that I interviewed that just won the co-angler event on the BFL gave you a shout out on the show that has not aired yet uh, for for your ability to help him out. So that is an auth- that that is a currency that, that a BFL win can't buy. Oh, you're saying so? Oh, okay. I got you. So you're saying the person who won the BFL said that about someone who who gave them but was transparent about what they were doing and then won that bfl because of that no i can blur my thoughts together because i haven't slept um what i'm saying is you being transparent and helping people that guy that just won the co-angler thing gave you credit for helping him like teaching him about fishing oh, i got yeah 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 100 percent. i get that yeah yeah it is um I see what you're saying. And there is a dilemma there with how like transparent you want to be um, and doing that. But yeah, I mean, if you have a co-angler, like if I had a co-angler that wasn't even fishing against me and say I was on Anna, I'm not holding anything back. Like I'm that person's going to see things that take somebody years and years and graphing out in the middle of nowhere where you wouldn't think there'd be anything to find those little spots. Like in that situation, I'm, I would be very, very transparent. And, um, I definitely am. I, I, I know, you know, guys like, like Billy Cole, like you said, and like Chris and all that, I know that they are very transparent with their clients and those clients are seeing, are seeing things that are very, very difficult. And a lot of times when you take clients out, they don't understand what they're even fishing sometimes and how hard it was to figure that thing out. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, you're right. And to grow a brand and then go into tournaments and all that, you have to, um, you have to sacrifice that a lot, but I think it's right because you can't really run a business. And unfortunately there are guides who do kind of just go to, you know, to the same thing. And, you know, it's just, they don't really want to let all the cat out of the bag. They think they can chalk it up to a bad trip, but now being transparent and, and all that stuff and very open, um, is, is important if you want to grow the brand or you want to grow a guiding yeah. business for sure. And it's a handicap in my view, based on everyone I've talked to, you need to get to a point in your fishing skills where it doesn't matter. And this is just for anybody. It's just, you want to get to the fuck you level where I will tell you it because I will still beat you. There is a, a scary yeah. confidence with those people because 99, the people that are the one percenters, they will share everything with you because they just have that, that F you mentality. Like I will still beat you. And, and that, is where you want to get mentally. If you're these guys that won't talk at all or like, listen, I don't want to teach kids because you got to learn it the way I did during world war two and that shit. It's like, that's not going to get you far in this sport. When, when sponsorship and being transparent is yeah. the currency of the future. It, I don't, I've had so many people that won't come on the show. I won't interview them flat out because they don't want to say shit. And it's like, well, this is not a cop homicide like interview here, dude. Like, you, if you're not going to be transparent, I will not have you on the show. I don't care. It, 
people still don't yeah. get that in 2024. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree with that. And especially like, I understand that some people have gone through, you know, years and years to figure out things and not want to tell people. Um, and you're right. You, there is, and I'm, I'm at that to a degree on Anna in particular, where I, I do, I'm very open and tell people that because I know that I, if, if that doesn't work or I have X, Y, Z, I have all mm. letters of the alphabet to go run through because of the time I've been on there and because I'm confident in my ability out there. But with that said, people, the average fisherman is a lot better right now. I mean, we 100%. did the, the youth clinic the youth clinics this year and I'm fishing with 14 and 13 year old kids who I promise you were as good as some 20 year olds. Like when I was their age, um, they they are just so much more dialed in. A lot of that is information. Uh, one kid really amazed me. I gave him, I was almost kind of testing him and giving him almost just a little bit of a bone and, and kind of seeing like where his mind was going to go with it. And he, he picked up something very difficult very very quick and it amazed me to watch a 14 year old angler so yet like that's where i think transparency could hurt you because some people you just got to give them a little bit and you name some names too and and i kind of feel that way about myself if you give me just a little bit you know you can figure it out so i can see where transparency can hurt you but at the same time you know you from a guide perspective, that's like where I have to go back to. You have to be open and honest and you just have to have to tell people and you have to be able to show mm -hmm. it that you can do it yourself. And then when the trip comes, do it yourself. And, and the hardest thing there is also mindset. Uh, and you touched on that earlier. If you're a guide and you get in the mindset of just catching numbers, let's just say, let's just say that's your mindset. You train yourself to find numbers, mm -hmm. which is probably not, it's the antithesis of what you're doing in tournament fishing. So you have that. Yeah. The, the other thing is when is yeah, it? Yeah, one hundred. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, no. What you just said there is actually something probably a lot of guys want to tell you is you what you just said. Honestly, that is the biggest thing because finding numbers is more. I will say this: some guys might get mad at this. That is finding numbers of fish that might not be the fish over three pounds in the lake. Sometimes that you need to do that as a guide, especially as a, you know, get out of, get out of the shit storm of a day that it turned into. So, so you're right. Guiding can sometimes go down to more about the quantity of fish you're catching instead of the quality. Um, I like to break my day up where get the numbers out of the way and then go do specific things for big fish and find those quality fish. Um, but you're right. Yeah. There, it is a different mindset when you're going out with a big group of people who just want to catch fish. They don't care. That is a completely different thing than, than tournament fishing. I agree 100%. And if you do that for four weeks in a row where they don't care about the size, they just want to catch them, and then you have a tournament, you got to mentally flip that switch to be like, now I got to go hunt five and not be in that monotonous, just go catch whatever swimming mentality, which is, that's a switch that you got to flip. Yeah, yeah, no, hundred percent. That is that is one hundred percent a switch that you have to flip, and and you have to know, and and it goes with because some you know you get some serious anglers, some guys that are real good that go on trips and they don't care. They some guys will tell me before, I don't even care if I get bit today, but I want to do what it is for that quality bite, and then that puts me more in the tournament mindset, and I like that, um, and I enjoy that. But then again, yeah, you're right. You have to switch back for. I'm almost going to the MLF format of how many keepers can you yep. catch, which is a lot of guide trips because a lot of people do just want to catch fish. A one to two pound bass to a lot of people and reeling it in and catching it in a new way out in open water is, is cool and a lot of fun and a lot of people enjoy that, especially kids. Um, but then, yeah, switching back, you're right, switching back from that to going to quality and, and tournament fishing, we're just getting five bites. That That is something I think I even kind of talked about this on the last show with you, that that is something where I can have a hard time adjusting back to because I'm so used to get my clients on fish and get them on fish and play the numbers game. Um, unless they specifically tell me, I just want big bites today. And then we well mix it up a little bit. Yeah, dude. It's just, I, I had a Patreon show yesterday about how to suck at kayak fishing. And I talked about this year and my kayak tournaments, and my boat tournaments, I 
I pressed bites. I got to see SB Fishing, McCluskey, and Phil this spring in the boat with them catch 36 freaking pounds on those stupid ass glide baits. Mm -hmm. And I just told myself, like, I'm going to try to fish to win, not with just the glide bait, but with flipping and stuff and forcing shit. And every tournament I did that in, I habitually did worse because I wasn't listening. I kept being, I, I tried to change my mindset out of fish what's available to you and just get solid limits and then maybe, maybe do something. And it, and it effed me up in the standings. I have somehow managed to stay top 10, even though I've had a couple of bad tournaments, but I, I goofed up my whole mindset, almost like a hitter where you're, you're messing up with your approach to the plate because I tried to change everything so dramatically. So I can't imagine what it's like for a guy to be like, we're going to go catch 10 pounds today with, for 20 fish. And then in three days I need to look for five. Like it, it, it's so hard, but I think when you communicate to people, like it's like an athlete, a hitter changing their approach to the plate every other day, that will put you in a slump that will mess with your rhythm. Yeah, no, it, it definitely does. And I noticed it a lot more. So early in the year when I'm doing a lot of, um, I do a lot of due diligence on the water early in the year to find groups of fish and, and, and do things. And, and that I really do just focus on getting the biggest bites, possible and i can get in that mindset and then when we start getting into march april and i have all these trips we're still absolutely fishing for these bigger fish but you do get into this oh if it's a tough day like we just need to go get bites yeah and then you're right you just completely switch your approach for that day and then balancing that in between and i found myself doing that in tournaments i've definitely gotten better at it at it this year like my my average bag weight this year has definitely been higher um but that and that was really because I just went to the change that approach of where uh, quicker I would still get into, all right, let's go get bites. Let's go get five. But now towards the middle of the year in summer, I'm only worried about five and changing my approach. But then when I have a guy trip the day after on that Monday or that Tuesday, I've got to kind of be able to balance it out too. And, and, you know, it, it, it's a balance between getting them happy, making sure they're catching fish and then spending time like, all right, like we got a lot of bites. Let's go try something different. And, and getting into that but you're right it is it's a, it's a constant mental battle between the two do you think it's also and i've always thought of, I, I thought about this more because the, i mean the episode that dropped this morning i had a guy on from michigan a guy on from ohio that i competed with in college a lot and he fishes the ohio river it's one of his home waters and that place is just a sad sack if you grow up like mccluskey yeah. flishing the res where you got to catch like a thousand pounds or you don't have anything or the ohio where a dollar fifty mm -hmm. gets you a paycheck which one actually makes mm -hmm. you a better angler? Cause I've thought it would be fishing the Ohio river, but honestly looking at McCluskey, I feel like it's, it is fishing those really gym places because you realize the importance of a six, you hunt a specific bite. It's not about getting a bite. It's about hunting the right bite. Yeah. So my, uh, when I actually grew up, I got very blessed in the bodies of water that I learned how to fish where I never grew up struggling to get a bite luckily with the two places the res i did fish heavy growing up and i fished another local body of water where it was always about the biggest fish and the way i fished for the longest time was always about getting the biggest bites and then when i started doing more tournaments later on and guiding i almost went back to the oh now i just need to make sure i know how to catch a limit every single time mm. so growing up I, it was i was always fishing for big bites i always was you know, throwing bigger than usual baits, fishing deeper, fishing offshore way before live scope and trying different things yeah. like that. Um, and with the bodies of water, I was fishing. It was just your average fish is a lot bigger than your average size fish on Lake Anna. Um, so I agree. Yeah. I think there's a balance. Like you, you, you do have to know how to put a limit together now, but with live scope and how yeah. the weights on almost every term, it seems like they're climbing. You're right. You got it. If you grew up and, you know, it was just about getting the five biggest bites or you're fishing somewhere that is a big bass factory and you know how to get those bites, um, I think it's almost going back to that. Whereas, like, pre live scope, you would see, you know, the guys that just could always put in 12 to 14 mm -hmm. pounds or whatever, they, they were making the classic. You mm -hmm. know, they were getting to the classic and stuff. But nowadays, and even locally now, I mean, everyone's just so much better. I, they really are. And I, I do think that you, you have to be able to, so just put your head down and get five big bites if you want to compete now. I a hundred percent agree with you. And that was kind of my, my mindset. Like you've got to get, if you, 
if you live in those places like the Ohio River uh, or places like that, you got to leave because that doesn't play as much anymore where it gives you an advantage that you can guts and nuts. Um, especially when you look at, you know, Taku, who with his 38 inch plasma screen, what he was able to do. And there is a technology thing, of course. I do think that plays. I'm going to upgrade my electronics this winter to make them a little bit better. Um, just so that I have an advantage because I know that's you have to be fluent in that shit to get those extra bites. You have to hunt yeah. five. You have to hunt five, period. Yeah, I agree. And I think, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm getting off. Uh, uh, this, you know, this kind of relates to it is like, I think also what we're seeing, because you'll see guys like like Drew Gill too, and, and on the local is a lot of people, um, you know, versatility, you have to be versatile, uh, especially if you're fishing like a long tournament trail. But I think there's, a lot of strength and just being the guy that is known for doing that and doing that. Like if you're a scoper and you're just going to go scope and you know that like you, you're going to be out in the middle of nowhere and you're targeting these bigger fish. That might be it. If you're a flipper, like say you're like a hunter shy rock and it doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing, you're just going to go flip. I think like really honing in and being a specialist does help getting you those five bites being really, really dialed on one thing. But you do still have to have a degree of versatility. I'm not saying you can't. You have to be versatile. You absolutely have to be. But just like honing in and being like the champion of one thing, I think is a is a really good way to you know eventually you know win and catch big bags. I think it definitely helps you if you are on the upper trails because example is John Cox. Why do we always see John Cox up there? Well, I think this is my hypothesis. He knows how to do a couple of things extremely well, but if he only fished one tournament trail, there would only be one or two tournaments each year that would line up with his skill set. But if he fishes 38 yeah. different pro trails, he now has eight to 10 tournaments each year that line up with the wacky worm and they're up shallow. And that's why every year it seems like, oh, John Cox is up here. It's like, well, that's because he's fishing so many tournaments. He has so many that hit up there. If you are a specialist that fishes like Anna, what does that mean? Because if you're a flipper, that only might be a two week window. If you mean you're going to travel around the region, now you have a little bit longer that your specialism will actually last. So I do think it, yeah, specializing definitely helps you the higher up you go and you can travel the country and hit that a lot longer window. Yeah, I guess when I've said so for me, when, I, when I'm saying that about, because you're right, what you specialize in would have to cater to the environment you're fishing in. Whereas at like Lake Anna, like for me, I would say I would be specialized in scoping offshore. Like that would be my thing. Like that's what I'm going to do or die. That's what I'm going to live by. I already know that if I ever win a bigger tournament out there, that's how it's going to be done. I've kind of accepted that. Um, yes, I can go and catch them shallow. That's how I grew up fishing, but but yeah, I think just like finding that thing that you're good on, good at, and then being able to exploit it throughout different parts of the year um, will we'll go a long way. But yeah, no, I agree with you 100% that, yeah, you do have a more leeway on those top trails when you're fishing 10 different tournaments throughout the country where the seasonal patterns align at different times of the year. And you can kind of do that, like your John Cox example. Yeah, exactly. I agree with that. And I think the one thing that will help you out in anglers like this, again, this is something I'm, I'm hoping to do with my boat this year, is, yeah, putting a putting a black box and a puck on the transom. Because listening to people talk about that, it, it and I know people bitch about this, and this is not the show that it's going to get into, it cuts down your, your time so much. And when I have listened to people talk about this on BassCast Radio and other uh, programs I'm affiliated with, it's almost like you're no longer hunting structure with side scan. But if you put scope while you're driving around the lake, you're hunting the specific fish and you're marking those in practice. And that's a game changer when it comes down to whittling down places in practice. Yeah, I could see, especially on a new body of water. I I mean, I think side scan is still like, like hummingbirds mega side mm -hmm. is still is fantastic. I still find new stuff on Anna just about every year still side scanning even the part of the lake that i am very comfortable like i could i can map out i can almost visualize that lake underwater from the splits to the dam um but i still find stuff with side scan 
So I can only imagine having that, but even the power of having that and going to a new body of water, like say you're traveling for a BFL yeah. to like a place you're not fishing and you, you have that on top of side scan. Yeah. That, that could be dangerous. The more I've thought about that, the more I'm like, you know, this could, that could really be like crazy. I could speed up your, you know, your pre-practice immensely. Especially in bait. Like when you look at like Smith, like when they're chasing blueback herons, like Murray Kerr, where you have a lot of pelagic fish, it, no matter how, in my opinion, no matter how good side scan is, having an LMS 34 at the console where you just turn that on real quick when you're at a point and be like, okay, there's three fish over three pounds right here underneath this school. Boom, you're good. Or yeah, there is a lot of bait blown back up. And like, it, I, I can see why people are doing that because it does, it just cuts down the the learning curve. But would you rather have that at the console of your boat or have a 22 inch screen up at the bow? If you had to pick. That's a tough one. Mm. They're, you know, bo- they're both traveling... free. They're both free. Yeah. Like, so off the top of my head with what I'm currently doing, I would pick the 22 and screen up front. Hmm. Um, because I'm, I'm talking about bodies of water and I'm really familiar with a lot. I'm pretty familiar with Smith mountain. Spent a lot of time fishing. There when I want to fish at tech. Um, very familiar with gas and grew up fishing there. And, uh, but if I were, were to travel more, I would be completely fine. Keep my 11 inch screen on the front with my live scope and give me something on the back, especially for new bodies of water when I'm traveling. I would, yeah, if I was traveling more to different states and more unfamiliar bodies of water, I would want that on the transom. But if I was like doing what I'm currently doing, I'd want that 22 inch screen on the front. It is so much easier. I, I hopped on the boat with somebody that has a, a 16 or 17 inch screen up front. And I was like, holy shit, it's so much easier to see a jigging minnow or something else like that versus a 10 inch. It's like mind blowing how much easier it is to track that shit. So I get it why Taka goes with that 22 inch plasma screen up front. Um, ooh, Evan Garrett, we got a couple of questions I was ignoring. My apologies. Uh, do you think it's necessary to have side scan and or live scope in order to fish big lakes? What do you mean by necessary? <laughs> Um, is it a luxury Garrett? Like, yeah, uh, Garner. Yeah. I think it's a, it's uh, everything we're talking about. is freaking luxury. Um, when I would go fish college events down South and you're talking these immense places like Lake Murray and shit, it is habitually, you need as much of an advantage as you can to cut down the water period because you're not there every day. And if it's a bait oriented tournament, like when we fish Lake Kiwi in, in late February and you're trying to find bait, if you had a way to cut down the learning curve to where you can blast through a cove and you see 180 feet both sides of the boat, be like, that's a bait ball. That one's got fish under it. And you mark that shit. You just saved how much time? Like all this is cutting down, in my opinion, just the learning curve of, and this is why it's deadly when, when a Jacob Wheeler has it versus me. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. He does. And so if you gave him scope on either side of his boat or Taku, look at how much water they can go through. And that's, that's the dangerous thing about scope is if you are unwilling to make the adjustments, if you're throwing a wacky worm at a fish over 30 feet of water and he comes up to it twice and then turns away and run, that told you to change. If you lack the ability to make that correction, the fish tell you, that's why you hate scope. But if you're the one percenters, first time that fish turns away and runs, you're probably making an adjustment and then you end up catching a fish. So it's just, yes, I think it's important at the highest levels to have all this technology hundred percent. Sorry, I'm ranting there. And I know Tyler's still on the phone. So. <laughs> oh no. I, yeah. I would agree with you. Like not to like chime in on too much on this question, but I would say like, if I was going to a big body of water without live scope or side scan, I would just be looking at depending on time of the year, mapping to me Mapping's is the biggest too, thing. Yeah. And then if not, yeah, I mean, there's always fish shallow too. Any time of the, any time of the year too. I mean, you can just go beat the bank and flip stuff and do all that and get bites if you don't have live too. Major League Fishing, the old show, if everyone's listening, the legit one that actually went on the Outdoor Channel, showed how well you can still catch fish shallow. When they were just thrown on a lake, they all had the same boat, all they did they would they'd go down the bank with small little crankbaits and jerk baits and just comb water and you'd come up with patterns and stuff. There are tons of fish shallow. And I would say, yeah. and that's hard because I remember to me, the biggest thing that helped my offshore fishing was when I got the spot one antenna from Lawrence. 
and it had that thing that shot straight off the front of the boat to where you could line up within a hundred feet of your waypoint and your boat would be facing it. And so once we marked a brush pile or something, you could come off pad. And when you went up front, everything would be lined up perfectly calibrated. And that the accuracy of that was insane. Like I didn't, I was so blown away by my boat at the time before I put that spot one antenna and after how much more efficient I was with lining up my shots. Um, so yeah, I would say like the mapping, the, the GPS antenna is huge. Cause right now the, the antenna on my hummingbird is just shit. It's broken. And that thing has epilepsy. I'm like spinning. So I have to find it with the scope to make sure it's correct. And it shows me like how much I miss having an antenna to where you're dead nuts lined up. You don't even have to have scope on the boat. So yeah, there are things like that that I think people overlook that we take for granted today in 2024. Yeah, no, I agree with you too. Like I, I have days too, especially, um, I did a lot this year, actually, uh, like in April on Anna and even in March where I didn't even, I took live scope off and I just went like, keeping that stuff fresh just beating like just doing your traditional beat the bank look at yeah. the map find like a little secondary point have live scope off and and do all that so i think that you know live scope definitely like you said is a luxury and you can still catch them you know catch them shallow catch them looking at your map and uh, having a waypoint yeah and, and cat um uh, mr michael cat who won the toyota series uh gardner and i got one more question and we'll make sure we shut this down so it's approaching the two hour mark but um he, he kept his scope on like when he was flipping bushes. And I think that's, I had to think about that for a minute because he did it to see if there were fish there lined up personally from mm -hmm. fishing shallow. I'm kind of a, I'm going to turn if I'm flipping like pads, spatter dock docks. I usually turn that shit off just because I want to be as quiet as possible. Cause I, I really do feel like that clicking in shallow water it tips them off and I would turn that off. So I a hundred percent agree with you. Like, like you don't, the data shows that, you know, from the person I had on yesterday, live scope is not what spooks fish. It's the trolling motor and the outboard and the presence of that 22 foot boat over top of them and the shadow it casts and all that other crap. And I, I don't think that stuff gets talked about enough about you got to be stealthy. It, it, those fish, they know when you're there and it has nothing to do necessarily with just the scope. It's, did you just drop on pad right on the spot? Well, those guys are gonna be like, nope, we're not eating yet. So yeah, there's a lot more that goes into it. Oh yeah, I, I agree. When I'm eight foot or less, my uh, my console graphs are off for a hundred percent to avoid. Like I put them on standby so they won't make that clicking noise in the background. But yeah, you, I use live scope very shallow as well. So I actually caught bedding fish with four we're not even on perspective this year you know in deeper water caught them that were they were 100 percent on bed and anna was so clear this year that you could even see that but i agree with you just being stealthy paying attention to like how close you're getting to fish how you're positioning on them and making sure your console graphs are on standby in shallow water especially a pressured lake you'd be amazed how many more bites you get just by making sure you have that back graph cut off and not you know pinging for depth and, and this is something to just tell everyone in the comments which too. Like it, I still think get, if you get power poles or a shallow water anchor system, what is a, a, a deadly move by that? Even if you're fishing offshore, like you, and you can do this offshore, I'll place myself in, in shallower water. Cause I have 10 footers power pole down and then just kill everything in the boat and just take a second. And I, I know this works cause I fished the, the Potomac so much in shallow water stuff that if you sit there long enough, the fish will get acclimated to your boat, almost like a deer stand. And if you are fishing yeah, a, a, a uh, if you're fishing like a backish end, I did this on Lake Anna this year for the tournament we were in, we were in halfway back on a Creek down Lake and I power pulled down on as where I could actually get the boat power pulled down. And so I could scope into the, into the Creek. But what I did is by power pulling down, I, I completely didn't have to be on the trolling motor anymore. And I just sat there and eventually the fish got acclimated and they started to move again naturally. And I knew if I sat on the trolling motor and tried to spot lock or just stay in the dead nut gut of the cove, those fish were acting weird. But as soon as I positioned the boat to where I could lock the boat down so it wouldn't move in the wind and I could just look around in about, I think it's like 10 to 12 minutes, they started to act more normal. It, it, it's something like being a deer. Like if you walk through the woods, those bucks get spooked. Like those smart fish get spooked. If you can figure out a way to just kind of shut that crap off, they will get acclimated to you and they'll start acting normal again. 
Yeah, and I agree with that 100%. We saw that a lot this year. Um, I did a lot more bed sight fishing on Anna this year than I have in, in past. And, and we, I saw, I noticed exactly what you're talking about is I remember positioning the boat and not even making a cast, not even moving, just letting it sit there for like that 10 minutes. And then you, you would see that fish almost go back to its normal state, lock onto the bed, that sort of thing. And, you know, it only takes a few casts to catch them. Whereas if you come in hot, Mm-hmm. and you make like your first cast you stir things up and you do that you're sitting there working for that fish sometimes if i'm just completely lying off and watching their behavior and watching step back up they well they'll just like oh that's just a part of my environment now dude yeah 100 percent um all right last last question of the night guys um because then i gotta get this this bitch edited and put up for tomorrow morning uh michael says uh i don't have a l scope but i carry a lake map a, a lake and a map uh bathometer map bathometer Uh, english is not my second language or my first uh using this uh with my side scan and down scan has been a game changer for non-tournament fishermen uh the new gt56 transducer uh, by garmin compared with my older transducer was a game changer now guys 100 percent. like i have side scan i love it i'm not saying that i just know based on having that great episode yesterday with the Texas Park and Wildlife Department that they did a two-year study that less than 50% of anglers actually have scope on their boat at this point. And it still only gives you like a 10th percent of a, of an advantage. Um, it's a technology, it's a tool, and it's a cool thing to learn. You're learning fish behavior more than anything else. It's not instantaneous. You don't necessarily need it, but it helps you learn. It gives you knowledge on the water of fish behavior, 100%. <laughs> Yeah. all righty tyler uh do you have anything coming up uh have you have you made any announcements based on your health or anything like that oh um, so you know i'm moving around a little bit more now i actually get updated imaging tomorrow and then we'll kind of go from there but we're still we're still running trips we still have other guys running trips through hypo guide service right now um, we're actually booked out this in, entire week, 4th of July week already, and then I should be back very soon, and then I'll definitely keep everyone updated with that, and I'm going to do do something cool once I can get back out there and, you know, try to, you know, I'm just looking forward to getting back out there, man. I can't even tell you, I am cooped up and just re- I cannot wait to be back on the water, and I'm hoping I get good news tomorrow. Do you have a timetable when you think that'll be? Is it August? Is it January? Is it, do you, do you have a vague timetable? You, you know, so the, the most hopeful would be the middle of this month. And that is what all signs are pointing to. I've like rehabbed this thing. I've done PT on this thing. I've like changed my whole diet for this thing even more. Like I've, I've done everything to get back. So we're, we're hoping by the middle middle of this month the latest would be uh, sometime in august but it's looking like in about two weeks i could be back out there sir i mean thanks again for everything uh guys i'll put a link in the episode description to all his information as well maybe we'll get a gofundme going for him or something to make sure we get him back out on the water or pay for some drinks uh <laughs> he does extremely good work uh again yeah thank you so much for calling in sir i really appreciate it this was a lot of fun yeah i appreciate it Tom. take care man Take care, boss. There you guys have it. The man, the myth, the uh, the legend from Lake Anna. I'm really glad he got to call in too. Guys, this was a fun call-in show. I mean, if you guys like this format, I will definitely keep it, and I'll, I'll keep it going going forward. Uh, Jeremy says, uh, moral of the story, find your own fish. Well said, sir. Well said. That Those are some some poignant words. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. As always guys, thank you for making this Monday night live fun. I know it's not like the normal thing, but I kind of think these call-in shows are cool to get you guys to you know, tell us your thoughts on everything. It was a, a very good conversation from different perspectives. If you could like and subscribe to the channel, it really helps us out in the algorithm. Also, we are only four, four Patreon supporters away from hitting our next goal. Only four human beings. And there is 30 or 40 people watching right now on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Could you please, we just need four more people to sign up and we are going to be doing a super duper massive party 
Probably going to be a Jake Spaden tackle. Probably going to be at Brewery. I'm going to try to get Tyler there. Jeff Green. It's only for Patreon supporters to say thank you. I'm going to pay for food. I'm going to pay for some drinks. We're just all going to chill, hang out, and talk fishing. That'll be later this summer. But we need four more Patreon supporters to make that a reality. It's going to be the first big, like, Patreon support give back. We'll have prizes and all that shit. But we need four more people to sign up. I'm done with my promotion stuff. I know people get yucky about that. Like, subscribe to the channel, and we're going to see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.